Welcome everybody to another fine tech show where today's hot topic is, is 27.5 dead? I don't even own a 27.5 wheeled bike anymore and I know also a lot of people who don't either, but let's delve in and find out. And also coming up, we've got some amazing top mods and some great rewinds as well. Okay, so let's jump on to this week's topic. Now this one is a little bit touchy. Could 27 half inch wheels face extinction? Yeah, all right, well, let's skip back to 26 inch wheels here for a minute. And uh, well, for starters, where are they now? Yeah, okay, they still do exist, but they're very much pushed aside. And when 29 inch wheels came on the scene well over a decade ago, a lot of riders thinking, well, they're horrible, they're disgusting, they're massive, they're too big a jump from 26, they're never gonna be popular. And look what's happening today. They're even popular on downhill bikes, the one type of bike that everyone was like, absolutely not, it's not gonna happen. Anyway, We've been split between 27 and a half and 29 inch wheels and what you may have noticed in more recent times are many manufacturers choosing to offer uh, size specific wheel sizes on bikes. So your smaller frame sizes tend to have 27 and a half inch wheels and your larger frame sizes tend to have 29 inch wheels which does to many degrees does offer the same ride basically for different size riders and offers a lot of common sense to be honest. I mean Canyon are doing this a prime example of a brand. But as well as brands still offering really fun 27 and a half inch wheel bikes like the Norco Shore, for example, which was really good and Santa Cruz have done this recently, there are other brands that are actually pushing 27 and a half inch away, quite influential brands as well. So first up, I want to talk about a little bit, uh, Specialized. So they're kind of, it looks like they're starting to push it away. And I know that they've just released an e-bike with mixed wheel size and for good reason on there. But the Stumpy Evo recently changed to 29 and basically pushing 27 and a half out of the way. Canyon bikes, like I said, a lot of them are size specific. So uh, very much offering the correct size as such for the size riders, rather than being able to pick the size wheel that you want. Now, don't get me wrong, as a taller rider, I'm not that interested in riding 27 half inch wheel bikes. They don't necessarily offer what I want out of a bike anymore. But I know plenty of tall people that do want to still ride 27 half inch wheel bikes. And they tend to be pigeonholed towards the more fun bikes, bigger travel bikes with smaller wheels, which does make sense. But what if you just want to ride 27 half inch wheels? Are we going to see them completely eradicated from mountain biking? And I think it's a pretty realistic question to be asking because Technically, mountain bikes could have been 29 from the beginning. So when Gary Fisher was first on the scene developing mountain bikes, they the first mountain bikes had 26 inch wheels because the tooling was there, uh, tires already existed, rims already existed. And it was the easy option to get them on the market and make it work. However, not far after, he was developing 29 inch wheels basically. He was working with 29 inch rims uh, or road rims, but using getting custom made tires done. In fact, he was responsible for the WTB Nanoraptor. He paid for it in his own pocket to get them to open up the moulds and make that tire. Uh, and also on the other side of the pond, on our side of the pond, there's a guy called Jeff Apps uh, who made Cleland bikes and he was making all sorts of crazy bikes and again he was running 29 inch wheels. Now had the industry been able to support it from the beginning, it's just possible we might never have seen 26, let alone 27 and a half inch wheels. We might have been 29 from the beginning. Um, pretty crazy way of thinking, but um, would you miss 27 and a half inch wheels? Uh, would you rather they stayed the same? Do you still miss 26? Uh, I know the wheel debate's been around long enough, but actually I think we're getting close enough now that 27 and a half could be at risk in future years. Uh, and I'm keen to know what you think about that. Let us know in those comments underneath. <laughs> Okay, it's news time. And with April Fools being this week, there's a whole host of new tech that companies seem to have coincidentally dropped. But what's real, what's bogus, what's good and what's not? Well, let's dive on in and take a little look. First up in the news then is Newt Proof's new e-bike. Okay, it's not quite an e-bike. It's actually got a motor. But Newt Proof on April Fools Day, they dropped their Scout Er. Scouter, Scout, Scoot, Scouter, however you want to say it. Basically, they've strapped a two-stroke motor, 80cc, onto their Scout hardtail frame, and it is quite the monstrosity. Have a look at it on screen now. Yep, that 80cc two-stroke beast, like I said, that was sort of their April Fools. But it does look pretty fun to ride, I'll be honest. And what I'd really like to see is maybe next year a four-stroke version. Maybe like a 150 four-stroke. Will we see Sam Hill line up at Anaheim 1 on a motorbike made by Nukeproof? Who knows? Or will we even see a Nukeproof actually bike? I think we're gonna have to wait and find out, but you never know. 
Finally, do you remember the days of double discs on the front? Yeah, you might remember the Marzocchi Z1, which had two brake mounts either side of the fork. You could run a double disc setup. Well, it looks like road bike brand Colnago want to get in on the action too. They've teamed up with Campag to offer a road bike with two front discs. And look at it. It looks insane. Imagine the stopping power from that. Psych, not really, it's another April Fool's, but look at it, it does look badass. And could you imagine the stopping power? Massive endos for days when those guys are descending down the mountain. Now, sadly, given the controversy and the sort of the uproar when a single disc brake came into play in the road world, I very much doubt double discs are ever gonna make uh, an appearance in the road bike world. But hey, it does look pretty cool and I'm kind of a fan of it, I'll be honest. But hey, that's it for the news. We got some great comments then from last week's show where Doddy was talking all about wireless shifting, especially as the new SRAM GX Access group set has come out. That's sort of slightly more affordable group set, shall we say, when it comes to completely wireless shifting. Now, JB Lee says, I love the tech and the look, that clean cockpit setup of Access. If I have spare money, I wouldn't hesitate to get one. Yeah, do you know what, JB Lee? I think that is what it comes down to. These things often come down to cost, but it's still a great bit of kit even at that price point, I think. And you've got to think over time, uh, that's only going to come down in price ever so slightly as we go through the sort of the stages of development. It might still seem pretty expensive now, but actually having used it, it is really clever stuff. It's sort of one less thing that you have to think about when it comes to setup. It's literally just plug and go. Uh, but yeah, when that trickles down a little bit more or the price comes down a bit more, well, I think it's definitely going to be a winner and you're probably going to find it on even more bikes out there. Next up, and Downhill Danimal says, how much longer for wireless slash cableless brakes? I think you might be waiting a while for that one, mate, because I don't think I would trust any kind of brake that wasn't attached in any single way. I've not heard or seen of any wireless or cableless brakes anywhere. I very much doubt Dolly has, and that man has got his finger on the pulse, but you never know what the big guns are working on behind the scenes. I mean, it would be pretty cool to see something that was like, completely wireless and could stop you, but will it happen? Very unlikely. I can't even think of any other sport off the top of my head that has a wireless or cableless brake. If you can, let us know actually in the comments because that'd be really interesting. And then finally, Matthew Toki. Love it, trying to twist my wife's arms to get one. Ouch, don't twist too hard because uh, it'll fall off. And that goes for most things actually pretty painful. Um, have a word with her, maybe get her a bunch of flowers because that's probably more likely to get you a uh, an access group set. But you never know. Don't twist those arms too hard. I'm rambling now. But anyway, that's the comments done. We're done in the show. Back to you guys. Thank you very much. Okay, let's jump into quiz time now. So I'm gonna ask you three questions and you're gonna hopefully give us the three answers. And yeah, at some point, I mean, I said this a few weeks back, we, we should have a bigger quiz. Uh, I have no idea how to figure out how to do it, but I think it's something we should definitely do. Or maybe we could save it for when we can all meet up at an event of some kind. Hey, that'd be fun, wouldn't it? Having a live GMBM pub quiz. I think that'd be ace idea. Right, so first question then. So. All these questions are related to wheel size, okay? So uh, what we discussed in the topic earlier in the show. So Specialized released a mixed wheel size bike in the early 2000s. What was it called? Next one. Trek released a mixed wheel size bike with a 26 inch rear wheel and a 29 inch front wheel. Pretty radical looking bike. Um, also in the early 2000s. So any idea what that was called? We see 29 inch wheel downhill bikes quite a lot these days, but who really pushed the envelope out and made one first? Pick up the answers a bit later. Okay, into Rewind now. This is, as you know, the retro part of the show. We get to talk about old, cool stuff. Uh, if you've got anything old and cool, or if you're old and cool, send us your details right down there. Uh, get involved. First week, uh, first one this week, this is amazing. 1998 Carpio Disco Volante project bike. Now, Carpio bikes, although they've been around for a while, were really made famous uh, by Josh Bender. He had that Armageddon bike with the two shocks that used to pretty much jump off cliffs on absolute lunatic, but it was Carpio, the maker bikes that used to ride. And this is gorgeous. It is really nice. So 1998 Carpio Disco Volante, um, this is from TJ in Fife, Scotland. My 98 Carpio Disco Generation 1 pre-bearing, so it used self-lubricated shafts. That's pretty cool info to know. 
Um, very rare these days. 2002 White Brothers DH3 upside down forks with 185mm uh, rotors on them. Uh, Mavic D321 rims. Of course, so back then they offered the 521 and the 321. The 521 still had rim profiling on the side so you could run brakes on them, uh, as in rim brakes like uh, Magura's or V-brakes or whatever. Uh, the D321 was the first proper rim that was shaped uh, exclusively for disc brakes, so it didn't have a sidewall as such on them. Uh, mega strong, great rims though, it's really good. Uh, on Hope Bowl pubs with brand new bearings, new proof, neutron bars, stem, grips, FSA pig headset. No way, I remember those. So the FSA pig headset was actually, it kind of came from the BMX world where flat landings and stuff on rigid bikes was destroying lower races. And most headsets would have like 332 bearings, stuff like that, I think it was the size. I probably got that completely wrong, but uh, either way, the pig had quarter inch bearings, which were huge by comparison, absolutely massive bearings. Um, weighed a ton as well, but um, but nonetheless, so good. I used to have one of those on a DMR Trailstar. Very cool, and I missed that bike. I actually left that in the workshop when I left MBUK. I, it was custom sprayed green. It had a big dent on it from the previous owner, and I got new graphics on it. It was so cool, and I wish that I kept it, because, uh, well, no idea who's got it now. Someone might have it out there. Have you got my old DMR Trailstar in army green? It did have a Dodd sticker on there, I think, somewhere. Um, be nice to see it if it's around still. And a few more images, yeah. So you've got a Manitou Swinger shock on there, so it's got a stable platform valve, so essentially an inertia valve on there. Uh, Finn from a Full Factory Suspension and I were talking about that shock and the Fifth Element shock a few weeks back on the Tech Channel. So if you want to learn a bit about those sort of shocks, uh, the link to that video is going to be underneath in the description. Um, but look at it, man. That's a really, really nice looking bit of kit. It doesn't even look that out of date either, does it? I mean, look at that lower linkage on there. Uh, so it's a short bar style linkage, so it's technically a four bar design, looking at it. Very cool. Way ahead of its, way ahead of its years. Disco Volante, yeah, lovely looking pair of forks those. And notice they've got the, uh, the piggyback on the, on the bottom of the fork leg there. Yeah, the same place you'd have the disc mount, but on the opposite side. Dude, that's seriously nice. Um, show us the bike when you complete it, I would love to see that. That's a, that's a really good one. Uh, next one is from William in my workshop. Um, living some past memories, uh, can't wait to fit these bad boys. No way, so you've got a set of Manitou 2 forks. You've obviously got these uh, more than second hand, I'd imagine. Uh, 1.5 inch offset, uh, 1.6 inch suspension travel. Oh man, look at these bad boys. <laughs> They're so nice, aren't they? It looks like they need a bit of renovation on them, a bit of metal polish, bring them up. I'd imagine you'll need brand new elastomers in there or an alternative. You could fit them out with springs like some people used to back then with spring kits. Uh, dude, seriously cool. Or you could cut them down into a pair of kids forks. Um, that's what I'd do if I had a set of those. In fact, I'm going to see if I could persuade Finn to sell me the ones that he built for his son because they're just hung up on his wall at the moment and it'd be pretty cool if I get them on Dustin's bike. Watch this space. Uh, next up, um, so this one is a Scott team from year 2000. It's from Rue in Oswestry. Yeah, that is a pretty legit bike as well. What's the rear tire? You've got IRC. Is that a Mythos on there? Um, let's have a look, see if we can get closer. Classic XT derailleur on there. Oh, you've got classic DX uh, pedals on there. So the Shimano DX pedals, the actual body itself would move on those. Scott grips that remind me of the Yeti grips that used to leave the uh, Ite, Ite in your hands. Uh, classic looking bit of kit. It's really nice actually. Nice looking bike. I can't see what a flipping tire is, I want to know. Pretty sure it's a mythos. So IRC, what happened to them? They used to make some amazing downhill tires and they were really distinctive because they had a tan wall finish, but it wasn't quite tan. It was like almost dark red, almost a brown color, as you can see here, the rear tire. They look so good. They made some amazing tires back in the day. Yeah, wow, completely forgotten about them. They just disappeared off the scene. Dude, so good to see this. A pair of Judy's on the front, alloy frame. It looks quite factory, doesn't it? That, I like it. Nice looking bike. I'm guessing it might be a haze brake. Can't see the lever. Can't see the caliper either, but uh, super cool to see it. Hey, so that was a great little trip down memory lane. Thank you for the rewind entries. Keep them coming and we'll pick you up next week. 
Okay, now it's time for top mods. This is all about the modifications you make to your bikes. The things that make your bike a little bit different to the way you bought it, or perhaps a bit different to your mates, more importantly. Uh, could be changing the handlebar grips, could be changing the pedals, it could be a respray, could, literally anything. Anything goes, anything is welcome. Uh, there's a link right there, and there's another one in the description underneath. You can click on that link and it'll take you through to our uploader. Don't forget to tell us your name, where you're from, and what you've done to your bike stuff. Uh, we'd love to see it. Okay, so this one is from Martin in Germany. Nice, so the bike is a Cube Acid 29 from 2015. Originally with a 3x11 Shimano transmission. I bought the Cube Hardtail back in 2015 as my daily rider to take the kids to school, ride to the supermarket, etc. Uh, pretty basic bike, 3x11, and over the years, I've gradually modified it and improved it, swapping the transmission for 1x11 XT, put Magura MT trail brakes on there, added some race face carbon parts, nice. I participated in my first ever mountain bike race, the Black Forest Ultra, on my 50th using this bike. Hey, congratulations, that's amazing. And congratulations on your 50th as well. Um, added with my boys growing older, I had to use this bike in places that suited more of their riding favour, uh, Winterberg, Villingen and Stride. During last year's first lockdown, I decided to strip the frame of the paint. Ah, oh, nice work. So you got it sandblasted. Wow. Okay, so let's look at some of your pictures. Okay, so there's the frame blasted. Man, it looks like a different bike. Wow. And uh, had it hand polished, brushed, and a full overhaul of all the parts, including a fork tear down using GMBN videos as a guidance. Oh man. What a cool job. That actually looks like a different. It looks like a different bike. I've, I can't, can't believe the, the finish you've got on there. I mean, I guess that's the whole point, is upgrading your bike, doing the modifications to it, and you don't need to buy a new bike because you've effectively given yourself one. I'm, I'm so impressed with that. It looks so good. And the graphics on there as well make it look factory like you just bought the thing. What a great job. Give yourself a round of applause for that. I'm not even, not even joking, I think that looks amazing. Really good. I mean, Henry had to go at doing a, uh, uh, roaring a frame and he really struggled with it but sandblasting it is the way to do it clearly he didn't have that he did his with nitro mores or something similar um, elbow grease but you've definitely got a pro finish on that so well done uh, and this one is the complete opposite so this one's from Leah in Hamilton New Zealand my dad's building a new bike an airdrop edit v4 very nice bike that but the frames came into the country um, sorry, a bit of frames came into the country, multiple frames per, bo per box. Okay, so the supplier then sent you the frame in a different box, he sent it in a Santa Cruz bike. Dad decided the box needed a little modification. I like it, that's a that's pretty accurate font as well there. Not a Santa Cruz. That's good. That's quite unusual actually, because a lot of people like to have a Santa Cruz, but you've got something a bit different, so I guess you want to uh, prove the point that you don't. And I can't help but see you've got a pair of Manatee forks there, and an EXT shock as well. So you've got a Storia shock perhaps in that box. And what fork have you got? It's got to be a Meza Pro or something like that. Uh, let's see the bike when it gets built up. Definitely want to see that. Uh, if you've got any cool top mods, send them in. We'll put them on the show. Okay, now let's get back to the quiz and get some answers. So the first question was, Specialized released a mixed wheel size bike in the early 2000s. What was it called? Yeah, it's the big hit. Uh, I had one, I absolutely loved the bike until I rode it through a really big rock garden and thought it was terrible because our 26 inch front wheel and the little 24 in the back, which looked so rad and was so much fun, um, but it was like getting kicked up the arse all day long. And I think they obviously moved away from that in future years, but the concept was really quite cool. It was super agile for something that felt really responsive. I had a pair of Shiver upside down forks on mine and I had one of the first models, which was, I think the colors called up like blood red, something like that. Uh, if anyone's got one, I'd love to see it, uh, see some images just for a bit of nostalgia. But I really loved riding the bike despite the hindrance of that smaller rear wheel. But uh, hey, it was cool. Uh, next one, Trek released a mixed wheel bike in, uh, I forget the year, but 26 inch on the rear and 29 inch on the front. It had the Maverick twin crown fork, which was designed by Paul Turner, who designed the original RockShox RS1. Uh, what was it called? Uh, it was called the 69er. Yeah, 69er, interesting name for a bike. Can you imagine having a 29 inch wheel on the front and a 26 on the back? Now, it never made sense to me. It just thought that you, 
your front end was writing checks that your back end can't cash the entire time. But people that rode them absolutely loved them. In fact, someone that, uh, by the name of Matt who works with us, he I think he might still have his one, and he always loved it. I think he set his up single speed because he's a bit of a sadist, doesn't like his knees, but um, he loved the bike. He said it was amazing. Uh, so also, I'm definitely keen if anyone out there has got a 69er, show it off to us. Let's have a look at it. And the last one, this is the coolest one. Who made the first 29 inch wheel downhill bike? So in more recent times, some people might have said uh, Santa Cruz, but you'd be wrong. It was intense and they did it back in 2010. In 2010, Jeff Steber made a prototype and it had 29 inch wheels on there, but unfortunately the tires weren't up to spec. So it wasn't really a big hitter because there just wasn't, nothing existed. He was using trail technology on a downhill frame with the downhill fork, had a Dorado inverted fork on there and it's called the 2951 because uh, they made the 951, which was 26 inch wheels. I made the 2951. Uh, super cool bike and that was really a taste of the future. In fact, there are videos about it online. Uh, you should definitely have a look because the way he's talking about the bike, it's just amazing that the rest of the industry really didn't pick up on it sooner. Uh, he was lightning years ahead by willing to take that risk and that's why Jeff Stevie is one of my favorite people in mountain bike innovation because he doesn't just like think about concepts. He'll make a rapid prototype and get on with trying it. He'll do real world testing to see what it works like. Then we'll go back to the drawing board and see how it needs to be refined. And sometimes you just can't beat that approach. As good as the computer based approach of research and CAD design and stuff goes, having someone to actually just sketch it out, get it made and go and try it. You can't beat that. I think that is super cool. Uh, there you go. How did you get on? Get any of those right? Any wrong? Get them all right? Let us know in the comments. Uh, and I think that's the end of this week's show. It is. Um, yeah, so end of this week's show. Hopefully you enjoyed the ride and we'll catch you on next week's show. See you later.